Good afternoon. David, can you sit here? We are very, very lucky to have with us uh, David Lipton, who is the acting managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Until Monday. Until Monday. Is that right? Yeah, Christina Georgieva was uh, selected by our executive board today. Today? Yep. Okay, so uh, you see how lucky we are? Uh, we have the head of the IMF here for, uh, and uh, David has been uh, deputy managing director uh, under Christine Lagarde and has been a senior U.S. government official uh, in uh, both the Clinton, and, Clinton Obama. and Obama administrations, right, senior uh, treasury official uh, in the Clinton uh, administration uh, on the National Security Council. In the Obama administration. In the Obama administration. Yeah. And uh, 40 years ago, we were sitting around writing our dissertations together. Uh, so uh, this uh, goes back uh, a long way, and who knew that 40 years later, uh, David would be running the fund and I would be interviewing him on, uh, on stage here, and Wing Wu was with us also, oh, uh, hey, Wing. How are uh, you? <laughs> another friend from grad school and a distinguished professor at uh, uh, University of California, Davis. So <coughs> David has had the remarkable career of uh, being involved in almost every major event and crisis of uh, the international they economy. All my fault. For decades, no. we do not, uh, he has been firefighting uh, for a long time, and that's where I wanted to start our conversation. Uh, when we were in graduate school, we were studying the high inflation of the 1970s. And I think in retrospect, certainly one of the major components of that was a shock on uh, August 15, 1971, when the U.S. under President Nixon unilaterally ended what was then called the Bretton Woods Monetary System, but the U.S. Uh, ended its uh, gold convertibility uh, in 1971, and suddenly all the currencies of the world were uh, essentially on their own, and the first decade of that was a high inflation period. Then to end that high inflation came a second shock, uh, which was uh, when uh, Paul Volcker was chairman of the Fed, and he put up interest rates very high in the United States in the early 1980s to end the high inflation. And that triggered, in part, a global crisis of indebtedness of the middle-income countries. David had just started at the IMF then, uh, I had just started uh, my career as an assistant professor at Harvard University, and one of the most memorable uh, moments for me was at the IMF in May 1982 at a lunch with the senior IMF official, David Finch, who said to me, you know, Jeff, in a week we're going to have a major global crisis because Mexico is going to default on its foreign debt. So that began another phase of uh, the world economy, the developing country debt crisis of the 1980s. A third crisis hit uh, 15 years later when after a devaluation of the Thai currency, uh, the Asian financial markets uh, linked to the US and, and global financial markets went into a kind of spasm uh, and uh, Asia fell into a very extreme crisis. At that point, David was at the uh, Treasury and uh, was over in Korea and elsewhere trying to uh, address that major crisis. Fast forward 11 years, uh, 2008, September 14th, Lehman Brothers failed, September 15th, 20, 2008, all hell broke loose, the worst financial crisis in uh, the era since the Great Depression, and uh, President Obama was elected, and David was uh, one of the key uh, experts uh, 
then on the National Security Council addressing that. So my question, long-winded introduction, is we've had financial crises roughly uh, every 10 to 15 years now, major crises, major upheavals. Um, the last one was now 11 years ago. What have we learned? You've been fighting all of them, and uh, when is the next one? <laughs> Thank you for that concise question. Um, I think, that had a question mark at the no, end. That was good. It was good. <laughs> I think we've, each time, we learn really well how to resolve the previous crisis. And the problem is that you never get the same crisis again because if you're able to foresee it, you prevent it. And rather we see the world's economy changing and in some ways uh, becoming more sophisticated. And, 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 and to some extent that's been driven by economic integration and the links that have come from that. So that each time uh, the situation is more complicated and I think, I hate to say it, it's been, the pattern has been more virulent. Um, you know, when the Latin debt crisis happened, uh, the only debts, that, the debts that countries had were all held by commercial banks. There were no bonds, there were no hedge funds. You could get bill roads of city to round up a, a, a room full of bankers and this fellow David Finch could go and say, well, what are we gonna do about this? And a decision could be made. By the time of the, uh, some of the later country crises, that was really not an option. And uh, you, know, you read about uh, the holdout creditors and the problems of just, just in, in, in dealing with debt difficulties, the problems of rounding up uh, creditors. I think it was that we started with, we started with um, sovereign debt crisis um, from con with countries that had overspent, overborrowed, uh, overheated their economies, overborrowed, and had uh, to contract their their current account deficits and stop their borrowing. But by the Asian financial crisis, we had financial flows, uh, capital flows, driving imbalances. Um, in, the, in the case of Korea, for example, it was that Korean banks, perhaps having exhausted the, uh, their ability to support the economy, started borrowing abroad and channeling money to hold up a system that was becoming unsustainable in some important respects. And uh, then the, the foreign banks, uh, when they got nervous, cut off those lines of credit. Uh, Korea used all of its reserves to uh, try to deal with that and had a crisis. So each time, uh, the, the, the world's getting more complicated. Um, the global financial crisis, uh, of course, uh, is, wasn't global. It was really a, a transatlantic US-European crisis. But the, the links among financial institutions across the, the, the Atlantic, the financial engineering that had created Struck, compl complex financing structures with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, implicit guarantees, structures that were based on transforming maturities and uh, taking liquid liabilities and putting them in illiquid assets. When that all became un un unworkable, it was so much more complex to deal with uh, for, uh, for, uh, for policymakers. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, what that means, I think, is that we have to always be thinking, looking around the corner and asking ourselves, where are the vulnerabilities going to come? You know, when I look at the present situation, I think that uh, we see a, a, a global economy where the core economies are slowing. If you look at uh, US, Europe, uh, Japan, China, um, their growth rate's been slowing for a couple of years and we project it is going to continue to, um, uh, to slow. And with that, um, monetary policy is having to continue to try to hold up uh, a core of the global economy where the private sector's dynamism is abating to some extent. And I think monetary policymakers are right to be trying to provide that support. 
Uh, interest rates have been low in, in Europe, are negative, and um, I think they, they are doing the right thing. But when you look at the byproduct of that, I think it is that uh, more and more uh, investors seeing these very low or even negative returns are looking for more remunerative places to put their money. Some, like pension funds and insurance companies, have some set liabilities and they feel as though they have to uh, uh, look for higher yielding assets in order to, um, to deal with that. So what we're seeing is, again, uh, I think a bit like the lead up to 2008, we're seeing uh, some increase in risk taking. Now, is it the same? Is it different? How do you get prepared for that? Well, we've done a lot. I mean, the, the world has done a lot to make banks safer. There's been a whole financial and regulatory reform to make banks safer, and I think banks are safer. But what we're seeing is that this new risk taking is happening mostly outside of banks. There are all sorts of non-bank entities. Some are institutions, business development corporations, they're called. Some are structures. Uh, uh, CLO, uh, 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 colla uh, collateralized loan obligation structures. And I think when we look at it today, we would say that uh, these structures, you know, somewhere between one and three trillion dollars of, of, uh, of, of structures that are in investing in quite risky uh, uh, companies, are not an imminent threat. But what will they look like in five years? You know, in, if you play the clock back to 2003, at that point we might have said um, that the real estate market in the United States wasn't an imminent danger either. But in 2008, what would we have wished we'd done in 2003 to see that this didn't become a problem? I think that the, that the, the question to ask now is, you know, are there, is there, um, risk-taking going on that ought to be uh, studied. Um, need more information because we don't know that much about uh, activities, financial market activities outside of banks. Analyzed, uh, limited in some way in order to avoid having a financial stability problem down the road. It's this kind of, uh, I think, this kind of thinking that we, that we need to do. I think it won't be easy because uh, there, there are great interests in, uh, from those who are trying to uh, get these returns and companies that are trying to get this money. And uh, there's, uh, it's always very hard to, uh, and, and I think it's especially hard at this juncture in our countries to expand the authority of the central banks of the world and the regulators of the world. But unless we can uh, get ahead of the events and think, uh, look around the corners in a sense at what might happen. I think we may run afoul as we have in the past of being ready to fight the last crisis and not very, being very good at dealing with the one that comes. That's a long answer to a long question. It was a long question too. Okay. Uh, but it worries me, one thing that does uh, worry me a lot, I wonder whether it worries you. Uh, first, uh, no matter what the uh, slowing or the geopolitical crisis, the trade wars and so forth are giving us, the stock market remains yeah. high and rising. And the demand for that by easy money is very powerful right now. Mm -hmm. Politically powerful and, and the interest group powerful. And there is a kind of assumption that uh, easy credit, whether uh, QE, uh, quantitative uh, um, expansion of some kind, can always save the day right now. Uh, and I wonder whether uh, that is... No, you, I think you're right to be worried about that. Okay. The right answer is that for years we've not had the right mix of policies. We, uh, you know, we're letting monetary policy try to address what's fundamentally a real phenomenon, which is the slowing of the, of the uh, dynamism of the private sector. And, uh, you know, I. It's, it's a complicated question, who should do what, but I think a different mix of fiscal and monetary policy is probably worth thinking about. But of course, if this really is a, 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 a loss of dynamism in the private economy, 
You have to, it's not, a, you can't solve that by having more public demand uh, for too long because after all, the public demand uh, will require borrowing and eventually public sectors won't be sustainable. So you have to ask yourself, what are public sectors doing with their, with the, with, with the taxpayers' money? And are there ways to be helping to invigorate the private sector, say, by, uh, in the United States, by uh, creating infrastructure, better infrastructure, that will be a public good and raise the rate of return on everything? I understand LaGuardia Airport is uh, being improved. That's going to make everybody's life a little better here. Uh, could there be more support for research and development that could perhaps promote the new, new thing that might be, uh, you know, a, a, uh, innovations or the use of uh, evolve, you know, evolving technology uh, uh, for more uh, productive purposes? Um, should we be spending more on education uh, in ways that would also, in, in time, uh, generate um, uh, new ideas that could be invigorating the private economy? I think we've got to think more about that. There are parts of the advanced world that uh, probably would benefit from a range of structural reforms uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. We've talked about and written a lot about the need to uh, improve the functioning of product markets and labor markets. I think there's a whole agenda there. We, we, we should be asking not do we boost the deficit and boost the stimulus coming from our budgets, but we should ask what are we spending all this money on, and what kind of, um, and what, you know, what are we, what are we getting f for that? Um, I think that's that's to me that's a, uh, a the way to go. Now, I, I, you know, in the meanwhile, if we don't wise up, I, I think it's, I guess, I think that the central bankers have an obligation to try, and it's, un I think there will be diminishing returns to their efforts as uh, they use up a lot of the policy space they have. And I think there will be um, uh, risk-taking behavior that will be a byproduct of that. But, but the risk-taking behavior, I mean, after all, people know what they're, they know what they're getting into when they, when they invest. I think as public policymakers, what we should care about is whether there's an, an externality that's not internalized. That, if someone creates leverage to make a return that's higher than the, to multiply the return of the, of, the, of the company you're investing in, if you make leverage, you take into account the risk to you of that, but you don't take into account that if everyone's levering up and that's driving the stock market and that's creating um, a, 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 an availability of funds to uh, companies that really are, are, are problematic, that there's a public policy interest in limiting that. So to me, we need to explore a much broader range of what we call macroprudential tools. We use macroprudential tools in, in some cases to uh, say to limit loan to value ratios when banks lend to housing because again, we, 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 we understand that that's the way to fight the last crisis. But we probably need to think about limiting leverage, limiting maturity transformation, limiting uh, liquidity transformation more generally because that's where the um, collective danger uh, comes and, and in essence try to let monetary policy play the support role and try to limit the risks through macroprudential policy. And then in the meanwhile try to come up with a broader range of policies to have a stronger economy. One of the uh, reasons the IMF was created in the first place was the failure of cooperation in the 1930s to first stop and then solve the Great Depression. And the Bretton Woods Agreement, which established the IMF and the World Bank, was an agreement to create a new cooperative framework. And the US was at the center of that new framework uh, starting in 1944 with the Bretton Woods Agreement. You're at the institution that is purportedly at the center of global cooperation, but we're not in an easy era of global cooperation right now. So what do you see, actually, in terms of uh, how to hold things together with the geopolitics uh, really changing now? I think it's the biggest challenge for 
the IMF and its membership. Let me start by saying that um, it's understandable that people are frustrated by the way in which global interconnectedness uh, can upset their lives. There are more spillovers from what happens in one country or one market to other countries. And we've seen uh, dislocation. I mean, no one ever said that trade was uh, Pareto optimal. We know that there are winners and losers. I think in the rich countries, we've seen some winners and losers, and the losers being upset about the disruption in, the, in, their, in their lives. This has happened in a way the more so that the poorer countries have uh, done well and progressed. That's natural. I, you don't see winners and losers in Asia because the growth rates are so high that you basically see big winners and small winners. If you look in Vietnam, if you look across emerging markets that by decile of income level, there are, no one's gone down in the last 10 years. Everybody's gone up, but the top has gained much more than the bottom. But in advanced economies, there are, in fact, winners and losers. Now, people may exaggerate how much it, it's the trade that's causing that. We know that technology, labor-saving technology, is a big part of that. And a lot of that would happen even if there weren't interconnectedness. But I think we need to understand this impetus that's given, this, that's given that, that's the discontent that's given rise to the populism that we're seeing and the various ways in which it's manifesting itself in the United States and Europe. So. One of the things we learned in trade theory 40 years ago, and I think it's basically true, is that because there are winners and losers, the theory is the winners should compensate the losers. Right. But I think in capitalism, you, it doesn't happen. In, 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 a, in a closed economy capitalist system, it doesn't happen. But what you can do is you can have social protection for the most vulnerable. You can have education and uh, health programs to make sure that there's uh, people are protected and there's opportunity and you can have better education in, in, in terms of training so that your economy can be more flexible and people who have to move out of sector A to sector B that that can happen. I don't think you can literally say uh, we're going to compensate everybody who's, who's a loser. I don't think that will work. But surely we need, I think it's the highest goal of the international community working together at the IMF to preserve the interconnectedness and let me, I think this is the key point. If there's, and this is something we wrote about 40 some odd years ago, if there's any hope for the developing economies and the emerging market economies to have uh, rising living standards that someday head towards advanced economy living standards, they need the interconnectedness. They need the trade, they need to acquire the technology, they need to acquire capital, to, uh, they need to be able to educate their people and then acquire capital and technology to put people to work. It's the only hope and if there's, a fragmentation. You wrote of a good dissertation on that. <laughs> I, Forty the, years. The ago. question, yeah, and the question is, why is it not working? It basically looked at. We did work together that looked at the the, the newly industrializing economies in, in Asia at that time, and what would happen as they acquired technology and had investment booms. How it would all work out? This should be what happens with emerging market and developing economies, and the question is, will Ethiopia? Will Tanzania, will Rwanda, will Ghana be uh, countries like that? Well, surely, if the world fragments and the rich countries pull away, it won't happen. There's okay. other questions about how those countries can make themselves uh, more, more attractive for... I think there's also <coughs> the, the problem that uh, when this is done with a region or a country as large as China, the success is freaking out the United no, States. I, agree. I think that's, that, I think it is. And while, you know, look, at the IMF, we say two things about the China, the US China tensions. One, that the tensions should be resolved through dialogue rather than through uh, tariff threats and tariffs. But we also say that China has to think again about its trade and other economic practices. China, had, has, has had many economic practices that were no big deal when they were a trillion dollar economy in 2000, at, roughly at the time they came into the WTO. They are now a 13, 14 trillion dollar economy. There are spillovers. What happens in China doesn't stay in China. I also think, and have made the argument with the Chinese, that many of these practices which may have helped jumpstart uh, 
the economy are no longer good for China. They're wasteful in many respects. And China could have a stronger, more balanced economy with a new set of practice. So I think there's a need to go from to de-escalate, to have dialogue, but also to seek uh, changes that will make sure that the, the uh, spillovers from countries' behavior do not undermine this, the possibility of multilateralism of into global integration for the sake of the Chinas of the future. We had the chance to work together this past year on the Sustainable Development Goals and a terrific uh, report by one of the departments of uh, the IMF, the Fiscal Affairs Department. And the question was, could poor countries afford to achieve the SDGs on their own? And the answer was no, uh, that there is a gap between what they could raise in national revenues or domestic revenues and what they would need to actually achieve the goals that are globally agreed. And what is needed, therefore, is some kind of income transfer from the rich to the poor to close that financing gap. And I, I thought the work was fantastic and very eye-opening, but what to do now? Uh, how, does, how do you see the IMF or the international system taking this SDG mandate seriously, but basically also saying to the rich world, you have to do more, which yeah. is not an easy thing to say, but it's an important thing to say. I think, like all of these international efforts, this has to be a partnership. You know, at the, just to say, at the IMF, our role in development is really in one area, which is to help uh, countries uh, create a macroeconomic environment that's stable, so they don't have debt problems. We don't want a recurrence of the, the, the debt problem that led to the highly indebted poor country initiative. There are some countries falling into that uh, trap. We want to help countries uh, to take care of their own economies and to build the capacity to be able to implement the SDGs. The SDGs really require work, whole of government work across so many different fields. Now, you know, I think the, 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 the upshot of the work that Jeff referred to is that the gap that is need, needed to be filled to achieve core S, SDGs, and we just looked at you know, uh, core ones of health, education, uh, uh, energy, uh, infrastructure, and so on. It's a huge amount of supplemental resources. We reckon that maybe a third of that has to be solved by the countries themselves. They need to mobilize domestic resources, find ways through their tax systems uh, and uh, through the saving, to, to mobilize the savings of the country to show that they're making an effort. The remaining portion, which is a lot, it's a lot of money when you look at any one country, but when you add it up, it's not a large amount of money for the world. Then we need to uh, convince the world that, coming back to the arguments I made, that uh, if, the, if the economies of the West are going to have fewer investment opportunities, the future for the German savers, Germany has a huge current account surplus, they invest that in U.S. Treasuries, they get very low return on U.S. Treasuries, that there will be opportunities to uh, have interaction with the emerging market and developing world that could be very uh, remunerative and very uh, healthy if those countries can develop. So put the money in now to help countries achieve the SDGs, become uh, serious candidates for uh, being the locus of investment and growth for the next generation, and that that will pay off when it, when, when, you know, once it happens, you know, if, if by 2030 these goals are more nearly achieved, you could have a, a more dynamic emerging market and developing world that could be the, 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 the next set of newly industrializing countries, and industrializing slash technologically advancing countries. It's a great vision. Uh, it was uh, in a great dissertation 40 years ago. Now you're putting it into practice. Uh, and I, I, sadly, our time is up. Uh, but thank you, David, for coming uh, by our conference this year. We're very grateful.
enjoy the next three days as managing director, uh, and then continue your leadership as deputy managing director of the IMF uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, Kristalina Georgieva, a wonderful uh, leader who's coming across the street, across uh, 18th uh, Street from the World Bank to now become managing director of the IMF starts uh, next Monday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.